Buddha said that when we meet with suffering in life, we tend to have two reactions. One is bewilderment, not understanding why they're suffering or even what it is, just knowing that we don't like it. We have no idea where it came from, what we can do about it. That leads to the second reaction is a search. And as he expresses the search, is there somebody out there who knows a way or two to put an end to the suffering? The search is when we get into trouble, partly because of the bewilderment. In other words, we don't really know the answer to our question. So we go looking outside and we can find we get all kinds of advice. It's like having a heart condition. Everybody knows what a person with a heart condition should eat and shouldn't eat. And they'll tell you. And I've learned since I had the heart condition. There's only one thing that everybody agrees on, is that water is okay. Everything else has, has its adherence and its opponents. And that's just a simple thing like a heaviness in your heart. I mean, think not in terms of the physical heart, but your mental heart, the mind. And in Buddhism, they treat the heart and the mind as basically the same thing. You can imagine all kinds of paths, all kinds of solutions that people have. But it's very rare that they actually point back to that first issue. What is the suffering? How do you put an end to that suffering? They'll find other issues. Say, well, to deal with that you have to believe this, or you have to give faith to that. You have to get into a right relationship with this or whatever. Very few of them actually point back to the original problem, which was there is suffering. And it's good to understand what it is, to look straight at it and say, okay, this is the problem, and what are we going to do about it? That's the approach that the Buddha offers. Sometimes you hear the first noble truth expressed, well, life is suffering. The Buddha never said that. He gives a long list of things. There's birth, aging, illness, death, being separated from what you love, being together with what you don't love, not getting what you want. He goes down through a long line of despair, pain, distress, grief. All these things are suffering. It's not really a definition, it's a collection of different instances. And you can probably recognize your suffering in there. But the, the Buddha says something really interesting. Five clinging aggregates. That's the essence of suffering. That doesn't sound familiar. If you go on the street and ask people how are your aggregates, and they think, well, you're talking about the gravel in my driveway. It's not a term that people are familiar with, but it's something we're doing all the time. It's important to realize these aggregates are actions. The Buddha defines each of them in terms of an action. Form, he says, wears away. You feel your feelings, you perceive your perceptions. You fabricate your thought fabrications and you cognize your consciousness, or the consciousness cognizes. These are activities, and we cling to them, which means we try to get our sustenance out of them. We try to feed off of these things, and that's why we suffer. How do you feed off feelings? Or you want pleasant feelings, so everything that comes in, you grab onto it and try to squeeze whatever pleasure you can out of it. And some things have pleasure, but when you get used to just grabbing sensations as they come along, you find there are some painful ones. And you try to squeeze pleasure out of the pain, and you suffer. So 
with perceptions. We tend to identify with our views about things. This has to be this, and that has to be that. And we can build all kinds of identities around us. This is where a lot of us go wrong. There's a belief that if you believe something, you see something in a particular way, then you're better than other people. And even though in the Buddhist teaching there is such a thing as right view and right perception, we hold on to these things not because they make us better than anybody else, but because they're more effective in going back and dealing with that original problem, the problem of suffering. Thought constructs, consciousness. When everything else seems to fail us, we hold on to the fact that well, just the knowing I, that's me. We want to be the knowing. That seems to be the thread that ties everything together. And yet when you look at acts of consciousness, consciousness they come and go. Your consciousness of things that was happening five minutes ago, where is that now? It's a memory. It's not consciousness anymore. It's perception. That particular consciousness, it's gone. And yet we try to build an identity out of these things. It's like building a huge, heavy building on very rickety foundations. So the Buddha's approach is not that you stop doing these activities, he says learn how to do them more skillfully. In particular, when he talks about fabrication. This, he says, lies in every one of the aggregates. You've got a potential coming in from the past, and you take that and you form it into an actual experience. And there's an element of intention there, which means you can do things with these aggregates. You don't just accept what comes. You have to realize you're shaping them as they come. Just to accept things, be okay, be non-reactive. The Buddha says that's the lowest level of equanimity. He calls it house-based equanimity. We just learn to be patient and endure, and try not to be reactive as things come and go. Pleasant sounds, unpleasant sounds, pleasant sights, unpleasant sights. You try to keep the mind non-reactive. That's the lowest level of equanimity. The higher one is when you bring the mind into concentration. This is where you begin to see there is an element of intention, in your, even in your feelings. Just stay with your breath for a while. Stay with it continually, and you find the breath smooths out. It gets more comfortable. That right there shows you're not just dealing with total givens. You're dealing with potentials that you're shaping. And so what we do when we give you meditation instructions is give you instructions on how to shape things in a more skillful way. You're going to take all of these aggregates and you're going to turn them into a path. Which is very different from just accepting what comes. And so the views that we hold to as we do this, they're instructions on how to do this skillfully. And again, you're here to solve the problem of your suffering. The views are not for any other purpose. We're not trying to win out over other people or show that we're better than they are or smarter than they are. We're doing this because we're suffering. And we'll be happy to share what we've learned with other people, but there are times when other people are not receptive. They've got their other agendas, their other issues. In, the cases, in cases like that, you just have to let it go, because you've still got your problem. It's part of the mind that's feeding on something in an unskillful way. You've got to find out where that is and what you do to put a stop to it. Because this is something that nobody else can do for you. When the Buddha talks about the causes of suffering, he has his short answer, which is three kinds of craving, and then his long answer is dependent core rising. But in either case, it's interesting to notice that the causes of suffering are inside. Suffering is something you feel. Other people can sympathize with you, can see that you're suffering about something, but they can't actually feel your suffering. And it turns out the things that are causing the suffering are on that same level of awareness, the level that you don't share with anybody else. It's not because you don't want to share, you just can't share. You can't take your 
experience of suffering out and share it with other people. You can tell them about it, but the actual feeling, the actual sensation, that's something only you can know. Now, fortunately, the problem can be solved from within as well. These same aggregates that are suffering and the, the craving that causes to, to cling to these things, that can be counteracted with things you develop inside, too. In other words, you use, use other aggregates. Use different perceptions, different thought constructs. You learn how to perceive the breath continually. You direct your thoughts to the breath. You evaluate the breath. It's fabrication. So you can create a feeling of well-being. Breath feels smooth, silken. Diffuse throughout the body, energizing the body, nourishing the body. The sense of the body from within changes because you've changed your intention. You've developed new skills in how to deal with these things right here, right now. So you take these things that are suffering, if you cling to them in the wrong way, and you do something new with them. You turn them into a path. And again, you don't do this to be better than anybody else. But because you want an answer to that question, who knows a way to put an end to suffering? The Buddha's got this answer for you. And you try it, and you find that it works. And in so doing, you also cure that problem of bewilderment. You begin to say, this is why they're suffering, and this is how you can change things inside. Change your intentions, change what you're paying attention to, change your perceptions. And that where there was suffering, now there's a sense of well-being. The more you stick with this, the deeper the sense of well-being grows, the more pre precise you are in seeing where there are subtle levels of suffering or stress that you didn't notice before. There come levels where you wouldn't really say that it was suffering, but there is stress. There's a sense of disturbance in the mind. You want to look into that. What's still disturbing the mind? What's still causing it to shake, to feel burdened? And as you do this, the bewilderment goes away. And there comes a point where you don't need anybody outside to give you the answers. You know the answer yourself. There is a way to end suffering, and it's in here. There's a dimension in here, too, that lies beyond the reach of any kind of suffering. And when you found that, you realize you found something really good, and that the Buddha knew what he was talking about. There is an end to suffering, and this is the path. This is how to do it. And you also understand what the suffering was. All the Four Noble Truths become clear. And you see what they're called? Right view. This is the right view for solving that original problem. So when questions come up in your mind, remember the really important questions are the ones that relate to this question. What to do to put an end to suffering? What is the suffering? What causes it? What can we do to put an end to it? That original question branches out and becomes the framework for the Four Noble Truths. Those are the questions that are really worth pursuing. Now again, this is something we have to decide for ourselves. It's a truism that everyone wants happiness, but other people have other agendas as well. You say, well, before you can take care of the problem of happiness, you've got to take care of the problem over here, this problem or that problem. And there's only so much you can do to help them see that the Buddha's explanation is really helpful. And there's only so much time you can spend on other people's opinions. What you've got to focus on is what you're doing to put an end to your suffering. Because no one else can do this for you, and it doesn't get easier as you get older. 
So do what you can now. Don't let the time pass without something to show for it.